the Lord Almighty. Welcome to Riverside. It's good to see you all here this morning. And happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. We love you and appreciate you so much for everything you do. If you're visiting Riverside this morning, we want you to know that we are thrilled to have you here and that Riverside is one church meeting in two locations and that we exist so that people will come to find and follow Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me and pray over the service as we continue to worship together here this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, for the privilege of gathering together this morning in your name. Lord, we honor you and we praise you for everything that you are here today. Lord, I pray that you would make us receptive and open to hear what you have for us this morning and that we would leave this morning encouraged and challenged to be better versions of ourselves and challenged to be closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
greater gifts than your love, Lord. For the moment of creation, you chose us. Above all else, you were even born, Lord. You picked us. You chose to save us. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing we know, there's nothing that we can do that would measure up to being worth your love. But we're so grateful that you choose us anyway. Lord Jesus, this morning, help us to be more like you. Help us to be even just a fraction of a reflection of that love that you give us. Jesus, above all else, it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. You can go on ahead and find a seat. As you're getting settled, I have a couple announcements for you before we hear from Pastor Mike in just a few minutes. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are visiting, if you're a guest here this morning, I want to make resources that are available to you. Both of them should be in the back of one of the seats in front of you. The first is a welcome brochure. It's going to tell you a little bit about who we are as a church, a little bit about what we believe in some of the ministries here at Riverside. I would really encourage you to thumb through that and, and read through. You'll, it'll give you a great idea uh, about Riverside. The second is the info card. There's an info card in the back one of those seats in front of you. If we do not have good and accurate contact information for you, we would love it if you would consider filling that out. You can drop it in one of the offering buckets on your way out this morning. We are passionate about getting you connected here at Riverside. There's an opportunity for every single person to connect and to contribute to what God is doing in and through the church. And we just cannot serve you well in that way if we can't get in touch with you. So consider filling that out. You can drop that in the offering bucket on your way out. I do want to let you know that we have a Riverside app. Hopefully, if you all are regular attenders, you have downloaded the app. If you're new, I want to make you aware of it. It is probably the single best resource when it comes to staying up to date with different things going on here at the church, different events, different outreach opportunities, different ways to get connected. It is also a great way to follow along live during the sermon. Uh, the notes are pre-populated in there. You can take your... would really encourage you to uh, consider downloading that. And I want to let you know about Bible Adventure Week. Thank you. I love that enthusiasm. I was really hoping I was going to get that response. Bible Adventure Week uh, is coming up July 10th through the 13th, ages 4 through grade 6. It's 9 a.m. to 12 every day. I had an opportunity to see bits and pieces of Bible Adventure Week last year, and it was just one of the most exciting and encouraging and fun things to watch kids just fall in love with Jesus uh, this week last year. So uh, if you have that age range, I would really encourage uh, you to think about signing them up for that week. I know they're going to have a phenomenal time. And for those of you who volunteered to lead Bible Adventure Week, there is a leadership meeting July 5th at the Mills at 6 p.m. Please don't miss that meeting. It's important for you to be there. That, uh, why don't you open your Bibles, open your apps as we prepare to hear from Pastor Mike as we continue in our series, Deeply Rooted. Today is a day of celebration, a day to honor the men who've shaped us and walked us through life. It's a day to say thanks to all the dads for all the times your strength held us up and the moments your wisdom lit our path for encouraging us to seek God all our soul and all our strength for living your life as an example of what a man of God should be. Thank you for the discipline we deserved and the grace we did not, for the memories we treasure and the lessons we cherish. Today, we thank God for all the ways you've shaped our lives. We love you, Dad. Can we take a minute and show appreciation dads in the room here?
Happy Father's Day, dads. I hope that you have a great day today and that you've been having a great weekend. We appreciate you. And what an honor it is to be able to reflect God, who he is, what he is like to our children. And so may I encourage you to continue to do that, dad, because that's leading your children well. And I'm excited to be with you this morning. Are you well? I hope as we are in, you ready for this one? Part 10 of our series, Deeply Rooted. We've been really camping out here in this series as, as we've been looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this morning, this is a big one. This is a big teaching of Jesus regarding at here this morning. It's one of those things that if you if you take just a moment and you meditate on the gravity of what Jesus is preaching, what Jesus is teaching, and if you think about if if it was adopted by the entire world, for instance, and it was deployed and worked out, we're talking about significant world change. And it comes from a source that, that is God, and we have to appreciate that here this morning. And so we're going to dive right in because there's a lot to cover. Chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, a teaching of God, him preaching, giving us an insight into how we as people should live if we want to live according to our design, and how transformative it can really be to do this, how necessary think about the world we live in as I read this text and how amazing it is. I'm stressing this, you see. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. I'm so thankful to God for it. You have heard that it was said, this is Jesus preaching, love your neighbor and your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Do it. It's a little tough, isn't it? I have uh, titled this morning's message, Deeply Rooted, Different Love. Deeply Rooted, Different Love. And then as I was kind of walking through the church before you all got here, thinking about this, uh, it should just be different love. Deeply rooted, different love, different love, whatever the title. We're talking about a different kind of love, a transformative kind of love. In fact, this is one of the greater distinctives of the Christian faith system is what Jesus taught here. And this, this kind of love he teaches and preaches about in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. And here's what we need to appreciate this morning in this text. There's a lot to appreciate, but God knows, because he is the designer of people, he knows what's good. And when it comes to adversarial relationships, Jesus knows what's good for you, and he knows what's good for them. There's always a them, isn't there, in our lives? The enemies, them relationships, the conflict there, the adversarial nature of them. He knows what's good for you, and he also knows what's good for them. But here's the kicker. He has to teach it. And because he has to teach it, it tells us something of its difficulty. The fact that he has to reveal the he has to actually teach it. It needs to be revealed. It needs to be taught because it doesn't come naturally to us. It's not something we intuitively know. We don't just know this. And really, I find that this teaching testifies to the divinity of Jesus because it is so otherworldly. 
this ethic, this kind of love. It's not our first instinct to do what it is Jesus is teaching here. And that speaks of the grandeur and the wisdom and the otherworldliness really of Jesus. Here's the issue. It was an issue that existed some 2,000 years ago, and it's certainly still an issue that exists here today. The issue is and was that God's people were really falling in line with the culture, the world, and with others and their ethic of love versus being different in their love. Their love was falling right in line with the kind of common love that existed all around them. Their love, God's people, it was narrow. And that was a problem. And so Jesus was teaching about it. The issue was being revealed in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43. He begins, he says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is what you believe. This is what's normative. You love your neighbor and you hate your enemy. Love is being narrowed in on this neighbor. This is what you believe. And you have taken it to mean further that you should therefore hate your enemy. The of love is to be around our neighbor and whoever fits into that category. And then we think, this is God's people, saying they think, that then means, okay, that's the boundary of love. Therefore, we should then hate our enemies. And Jesus is calling this out. This is an issue. And this is really still the issue. <laughs> it's still the issue. There are people that we love, and if we're going to be honest, at times, there are people that we hate. It's a little bit easier identify the truth of this statement if we don't make it personal. People have people that they love, right? And then people have people that they hate. Isn't that true? It is true. This is what's common. All you have to do is turn on the news. All you have to do, are we still turning on the news? If you're opening your phone, what is turning on the news, yet opening an application, right? Uh, or if you <laughs> go on Facebook, you'll see that people love and people have people that they hate. We see this all the time. And this is not what God wants for us. This is not what God wants for others. Why? Because it's not honoring to God. And, quite frankly, it's not good to have these kinds of boundaries of love, that we're loving certain people and hating others. This isn't honoring to God, and nor is it good for us. In the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s, in the height of the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he knew this reality that it's not good. It's not good for us to kind of live with hate, and it's not honoring to God. He was experiencing the devastating effects of a kind of hate that can be extended toward people. And on a sermon on December 24th, Christmas Eve on 1967, a Christmas sermon for peace, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself and every time I see it I say to myself hate is a burden to bear it's not good for us Jesus knew this he goes on to say somehow we must be able to stand up against our most bitter opponents and say we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering meet your physical force, force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will still what? Love you. But be assured that we'll wear you down by our capacity to suffer, and one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves, 
We will appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he was aware of the problem, keenly aware of the problem. In the height of the civil rights movement, of, of racism and, and racial tensions, understanding that hatred. He knew the problem of hate. And yet, here's what I appreciate. There's a lot of people who can reveal problems. Dime a dozen to point out problems. Here's what's impressive, and it's directly tied to his faith. He had his solution. He knew. He also knew the solution. There's the issue, and yet then there's Jesus' instruction. The issue is clear. There are boundaries on love. People love certain people and people hate certain people. You have heard that it was said, and hate your enemy. That's the issue. But then Jesus brings in the instruction. The instruction, how glorious, how amazing, how restorative, how powerful, how otherworldly is this? The instruction, Matthew 5.44 Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I look and you look left and right, and we're seeing people hate people and tearing people apart. It's only going to get worse in the next couple of years. You know what I'm saying? Coming up. It's prime territory for people just shooting at one another. The hate is so, I got to tell you, as a pastor, I'm feeling this. I'm already starting to feel this. Like, I'm feeling the weight of this. Looking back at how elections have been, I'm nervous. I'm nervous for our people. I'm nervous for you. I'm nervous for me. I'm nervous of the culture. I'm nervous not of what's going to happen. God's got it. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about how people are going to chop one another down. I'm worried about it. Be praying about it. We can do something even right now. We can build something within our own lives, a kind of understanding of God and what he wants for us that I hope will prepare us for that season and hatred. We can do something about it now by heeding the words and instruction of Jesus. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love is a hijacked word in our culture to mean a lot of different stuff, most of which is not love. It's just not. Now, here's a great definition of the word love. Costly self-sacrifice for another's good. The killer definition for love. A costly self-sacrifice for another's good. A parallel passage to this Sermon on the Mount is recorded in Luke chapter 6, verse 35, and it speaks of this kind of love and what it actually looks like in practice. It says this, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Here in Luke chapter 6, verse 35, you get all of the components of what true love is. A costly lend without expecting something. That's also a sacrifice. Costly self-sacrifice for another's good. That's love. Also, looking for someone's good. Good for someone may not mean support. Good might mean confrontation. Good might, be, might mean blessing. Good um, doing something. Good might mean telling someone something. Good is God. It's going the way of God for people. It's giving people God and what God wants for people. That's love. Doing that in a self-sacrificing way that costs. Love is a costly self-sacrifice for another's good. And it's active. It's active. It does stuff. Love does. That's a book I just gave Gavin here. See how it all comes together, Gavin? <laughs> Didn't even plan that. And it does. Love is active, which is important actually to mention because in the realm of romance, love is like, ooh, it's like this thing, you know? <laughs> Something you feel. Whereas here's what you do. And in that way, 
especially where Jesus is saying we should direct our love. <laughs> let's let's rem be reminded because we like we love it. We love the idea of love. Yeah, costly self-sacrifice for another's good. I just love that, and because I love my kids, and I want to love them. I want to them, right, Dad? Father's Day, costly self-sacrifice for my son or my daughter's good. That's love. My wife, my husband, my friends. Jesus, you ready for this? But I tell you, love your enemies. Christian love must be different. Christian love must be different. When the culture, when others are looking to Christians, are they seeing followers of Jesus as being loving and loving to everyone? How is the Christian love to be in its reach and in its display, in its reach, meaning we're not just loving our own. There's a caricature of Christian right now that we just love our own. And I do mean caricature, meaning a false and phony representation. Maybe some few have created perspective for all. Let's redefine it. Let's bring it back. Because as Christians, our love is to reach beyond those within and is supposed to reach those without, beyond our enemies. And it's supposed to be a grand display. When meditating on this passage, I was brought to an extreme example, something that had a profound impact on me growing up in southern New Jersey. I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in southern New Jersey. And I was about an hour and a half outside of a town called Nickel Mines. Nickel Mines in Lancaster County. It is Lancaster, not Lancaster. I'm just letting you know. Do with it what you will. Just letting you know. An hour and a half outside of Lancaster in southern New Jersey, the year was 2006. Does this begin to ring some bells? 2006, if you remember, a horrible tragedy in the little town of Nickel Mines, Lancaster County. A man by the name of Charlie Roberts, he um, walked into a one-room schoolhouse, an Amish one-room schoolhouse, and he barricaded the door, and he um, tied up a bunch of children. And he released all the boys and the adults and lined up 10 girls across the front of the school um, inside that room. And he systematically shot each one of them. Five were killed. Five were wounded. And a dead reality of the kind of hatred that can exist in a person's heart. It impacted me so much so that even still today, I think about it. And every once in a while, I still think about it. And for those of you who are interested, there is a book that was released in 2007 that I greatly appreciated called Amish Grace. Perfectly titled. Why? Because the Amish responded in a way that was really otherworldly. Amish, quick side note. Christians, a Christian. Separatists, Christians, have these huge faith, family, community, um, purity or simplicity. Those are like the main tenets of, of the Amish belief system and way of life. They're deeply rooted in the Christian way. And this is ethic of love and forgiveness. I came across this uh, news article. I went back and found this news article in The Guardian, and a uh, pretty important headline here. It's a, a, an article, and in the article it said, On the day of the killings, members of the Nickel Mines community, the Amish community, took... F okay, hang on, real quick. Okay, so on the day of the killing, the families of these little girls, aged 6 to 13, I believe, Ten in total victims on the day of 
workers of the nickel mines community took food to Robert's widow. Six days after the shooting, families who had just buried their daughters attended Robert's funeral. Money from funds that poured in from around the world was diverted to the killer's family. Many victims faced huge medical bills. The Amish believe that harboring anger and resentment is corrosive, something Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. knew. Too strong, too heavy a burden to bear, hate. Eat you up is a quote, Esh Sr. said. Forgiveness, he said, quote, is so ingrained in our heritage that it's a part of our character. Terry Roberts, the gunman's mother, has become a friend to many of the Nickel Mines families who were affected by what her son did. He to gatherings and often visits Rosanna King, who was six when Charles Roberts shot her, and she is confined to a wheelchair, unable to talk, and fed through a tube. She has seizures. The Amish modeled this kind of love well. What it looks like to love our enemies. It's not just lacking retaliation. And even that would be something pretty admirable, admirable within our culture right now. If we were done wrong or if people were done wrong and there just simply wasn't a new retaliation effect. But this kind of love is not just lacking retaliation. It's not just showing tolerance. It's about active love. Active love, sacrificing for another's good, even if it costs us something. Some of the buzzwords out of that article as a, a demonstration of their love, a display of their love, the reach and display of their love. They took food, attended Robert's funeral, diverted money, defended Robert's mother, invited her to their gatherings. This love it's different. Isn't that different? It's so different that I read that those who were affected in uh, Virginia Tech and one more mass shooting, it's escaping me, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, which also uh, was close to home as well, having grown up just outside of Newtown as well. Those folks were reaching out to the Amish community to ask, how do you do this? And that's just so powerful, isn't it? The witness, the kind of love Jesus wants us to display, the kind of reach of that love that extends beyond even to our enemies. I'm an annoying preacher, aren't I? Why? Because it's unfair and it's realistic, isn't it, preacher man? to use Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to use the Amish community of nickel mines. Isn't this unrealistic? These are superhuman people. No. This is what's attainable for the Christian life. What God wants for people. He wants them to be able to have this kind of capacity to love. Do you see yourself as having this kind of capacity to love? If you're a Christian, if you call on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have every resource given to you by God himself to be able to live of reach and display of love. So many of us are so trapped because it is a heavy weight and burden to bear under hate, under the wrong that has been done to you. There's never a denial. That has been done to you. Charlie Roberts was guilty. Those who were committing these racist acts were guilty. And yet there is still this commission by God to what? To love our enemies. He goes on to say, I tell you, Matthew 5 44, this is the instruction. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There is an emphasis on prayer, speaking, 
praying for and on behalf of our enemies, utilizing our heart and our mind and our words to verbalize our love in prayer to God. Couldn't help but think of Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, where Jesus says, the makes what the heart is full of. When God is commissioning us, Jesus is commissioning us to pray for our enemies, he's really saying, I want to get after your heart. I want to change your heart. And the way that you change your heart is you begin praying for people who you don't love, <laughs> who hate. This is a part of the instruction. This is a part of the antidote to the disease of hate on a person's heart. It's taking our, our words and saying, heart, shh, listen to these words that I speak out to God on behalf of my enemies. In fact, our words carry a lot of weight. Very important. James chapter 3, verses 3 through 4 uses these metaphors and these similes to attach the tongue, meaning the words the tongue in that place from which words flow, it's like a bit in a horse's mouth. It can steer our lives the way that we speak. Like a rudder on a ship, very small, the tongue, and yet it can navigate a person's life. And here Jesus is saying, I want to navigate your life toward loving your enemies. And a way to do that is to pray. That's how you can take hold of the steering wheel of the hate that you feel in your heart for those who are your enemies. Grab that steering wheel and the direction of godliness is through prayer. And in fact, an amazing thing occurs when we pray. A really cool cycle begins. Here's my great illustration. Microsoft Word. <laughs> could not, I could not get these. It seems imperfect. I could falsify like the intention there and say, it's just not going to be perfect. It's going to be messy. <laughs> nope, I just didn't know how to use Word. Here's the awesome effect. If you find that you're having trouble loving your enemies, pray for them gets tougher and tougher to hate those you pray for. And don't just pray like, God, I pray that you will show them. <laughs> it's not going to work that way. Man, it doesn't work. As we pray, as we honestly petition, as we lift up, God, bless them, help them, God, forgive them, show them your love, bless their day, open their eyes, pray for me, God, help me. As we begin to pray for our enemies, what begins to happen is we get, begin to grow in our love. And as we begin to grow in our love, we're compelled to, again, pray for those whom we love. And as we pray for those whom we love, we begin to love them even more. And just this beautiful, wonderful, God-designed effect begins with prayer and love for our enemies. Yes, prayer changes things and people outside of us, but it also changes us. It makes us more loving. When we pray for the good of our enemies, we steer our lives towards love for them. Absolutely essential for loving our enemies. Donnie, remember when I texted you this week and I said I needed to read you something? Looks like I'm going to read it to you now in front of everyone. I've been quoting Dietrich Bonhoeffer this series a lot because Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote called The Cost of Discipleship. So you got Amish Grace, The Cost of Discipleship. I would encourage you to buy both of them if you're a reader. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was alive during uh, Nazi Germany, and he was a part of the resistance. And as a Christian, he was being persecuted for his faith. And... When meditating on this text, I have to read this. And I had it as like, should I read it or not read it? And I have to read it because it's just so good. This is his thoughts, uh, a, a German theologian and pastor under persecution. 
Nazi regime in Germany. And he's reflecting on this passage of, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He says this, this commandment that we should love our enemies and forego revenge will grow even more urgent in the holy struggle which lies before and in which we have partly already been engaged for years. In it, love and hate engage in mortal combat. It is the urgent duty of every Christian soul to prepare itself for it. The time is coming when the confession of the living God will incur not only the hatred and the fury of the world, for on the whole it has come to that already, but complete ostracism from human society, as they call it. The Christians will be hounded from place to place, subjected to physical assault, maltreatment, and death of every kind. We are approaching an age of widespread Therein lies the true significance of all the movements and conflicts of our age. Our adversaries seek to root out the Christian church and the Christian faith because they cannot live side by side with us because they see in every word we utter and every deed we do, specifically directed against them, a condemnation of their own words and deeds. They are not far wrong. They suspect, too, that we are indifferent to their condemnation. Indeed, they must admit that it is utterly futile to condemn us. We do not reciprocate their hatred and contention. We would like it better if we did, and, and so sink to their own level. And how is the battle to be fought? This is the question, Christians. How is the battle to be fought? Soon the time will come when we shall pray. Not as isolated individuals, but as a congregation, a church. We shall pray in multitudes, albeit in relatively small multitudes. And among the thousands and thousands of apostates, we shall loudly praise and confess the Lord who was crucified and is risen and shall come again. And what prayer, what confession, hymn of praise will it be? It will be the prayer of earnest love for these very sons of perdition who stand around and gaze at us with eyes aflame with hatred and who have perhaps already raised their hands to kill us. It will be a prayer for the peace of these errant, devastated and bewildered souls, a prayer for the same love and peace which we ourselves enjoy, a prayer which, we, which will penetrate to the depths of their souls and rend their hearts more grievously than anything they can do to us. Yes, the church which is really waiting for its Lord discerns the signs of the times of decision must fling itself with its utmost power and with the panoply of its holy life into this prayer of love. Whew. Facing imminent death and real persecution. This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to say. We must thrust, we must throw ourselves into this kind of prayer. To love our enemies, knowing them, being mindful of them. Knowing them. Do we actually know? If we were to sit down and actually say, God, who, who are my enemies? To love our enemies, knowing them, being mindful of them, sacrificing, wanting, praying, and acting what's for what's good for them. That's what Jesus is saying. That's... That's what I'm expecting of my followers. That's what's going to be honoring to God, and that's what's going to be good for our own souls. Hate is just too much a burden to bear. The issue is clear. And he action of God to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. What is our motivation as Christians? You have the issue. We have the instruction. What is the motivation? The motivation thing. If we don't have the right motivation to love our enemies, we will find ourselves unable to love our enemies. The motivation is everything. And the motivation of the Christian life is to, our ability to love our enemies is directly tied to our understanding that God loved us. 
He loved us as his enemies. When we were undeserving of his love, he extended it to us. He died for us because why? He loved us. I find it so powerful that Jesus, he doesn't just, he doesn't just preach to embody himself. He is the greatest embodiment of this truth of love, you see. In fact, it's so powerful, his love. It's supposed to be so transformative to our lives when we don't deserve it that it's supposed to revolutionize the way we see other people. That's how God has designed this mechanism to work. The more we understand Jesus, the more we understand the love of God for us, the more we understand what it took for God, the creator who was perfectly innocent, to die in our place on the cross when we were guilty, the more we inhabit those that reality, the more we think about it, the more we meditate on it, the more we in love with God, and the more we are oh, so compelled to love others in the same way. This model that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, how powerful is this? Excuse me, chapter 23, 33 through 38. Depicting this moment of Jesus' crucifixion, when they came to the place called the Skull, that was Golgotha, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his Here's the moment. Jesus' God's enemies literally nailing his hands to wood. How's he going to react? This is the God who said, remember, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. And as he's standing, as he's on the cross, unjustly, an innocent man by those who hate him, his enemies, we put him there. What is it that he did? What is it that he said? He prays for them. Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Unjustly hanging at just a moment. This is the same God who spoke the world into existence. You think he's unable to give He spoke the world into existence. And when he has a moment to speak, what is it that he says? The same God who spoke the world into existence, he said, Forgive them. He sacrificed costly. The others good. And what do they do? They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked wine and vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, then save yourself. <laughs> there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. <laughs> Little did they know with just one word, did it all. And yet, what's the word he spoke? Forgive him. God, forgive him. This is the model we are to follow. This is what love looks like. You see, Romans 5, 6 through 8, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, his enemies. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. That's true. Remember, you have heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Though for a good person, someone might to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. And here's the beauty of it. This kind of love, loving our enemies, it's relative. It's costly. Yeah, but it was also personally satisfying to God, and it opened the door to reconciliation. The reality is, yes, enemies hurt us. But there is only one way, 
heal the wound. If you're feeling some kind of wound of hatred in your life, there's only one way to heal that wound. It's to love them. Godly love them. Costly self-sacrificing for that other's good love them. Not to hate them. It's a pretty probing question that Jesus asks in Matthew chapter 5, verse 47. When it comes to our love, what are you doing more than others? The devil returns bad for good. People, this is the way we operate, we left and right, return good for good. God, he returns good for bad. What are we, you, me, doing more than the good for good thing? This is a strong question, one that's just been <sighs> nagging at me. To love in a way that is more, to love our enemies that in the perfect love that is described in verse 48. To be perfect in our love, in the quality, in the shape, in the dimension, in the model, in the same measure is the word, same use, perfection, of God. Christian, be deeply rooted in a different love. You know, God is love. We must be deeply rooted in him in order to do and be loving, to do love, to loving. We have to be deeply rooted in God, in this kind of love for those who are uh, even our enemies. A question I've been asking myself, and maybe it's a question you should write down as well. Who is outside the boundary of my Who's not within the reach of my love right now? We've got our lists. We have the things that have happened to us. And maybe even now it's like hurting to imagine this love. You're going to keep hurting. That hate is too much a burden to bear. Drive yourself. We must drive ourselves deeper and deeper into the gospel. The more we drive ourselves down deep into the gospel, the good news of Jesus, what he did on the cross for his enemies, the more we drive ourselves deeper into it, the more we should to love our enemies. Be deeply rooted in a different kind of love. For that's the love that was extended to us. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. It's challenging. It's tough. But we all know worldly and glorious and good it is. And God, we recognize that you paved the way. You led the way. You charged into this kind of love. In the forest of hate, you chopped it down, God, and you provided a way out. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray you would help us who have maybe been imprisoned by the hate that we have felt to the wrong that has been done to us. We don't invalidate that, love, that wrong here today, God, but I pray that you would help us to understand you and your word and your gospel more deeply so that we would be compelled to love those who are outside of our reach, our enemies. And as we do so, God, I pray you would do a restorative work I pray that enemies, as a result of this kind of love extended, would become friends. That people, like they were drawn to the Amish in their display of your love, I pray that people would be drawn to us and ultimately you because of our extended love. God, as we pray for those who persecute us, I pray you would grow our love for them. That we would begin to see change in our own hearts and in the hearts of our enemies as a result. And that ultimately and for every reason, you would be glorified as the result, because that's why we're doing it. That's the motivation, for we are not children. We do it. Help us as your children to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God's word. It's good, isn't it? It's tough, but it's good. It's so good. Who else is saying this on Facebook? It's what we need going into the next season. Are we ready? 
Spirit's there to help us. God himself is there to help us along the way. Can we stand and let's take a moment to worship this God? And this is a moment, step one in the process of learning and being able to love our enemies is to become consumed with God, whom he is and what he has done. And so let's take this a moment, take advantage of this moment in worship to do that, to drive ourselves deeper into the goodness and the gospel, the good news of God. Amen? Amen. I love
feel it. Glory to you, Lord. Even when I'm in the midst of pain, glory to you, Lord. Even when I know I don't deserve it, glory to you, Lord. Bring us, you Jesus, bring us down as you come down to meet us. Thank you for your spirit, Lord, filling this place to God forever. here on earth in our humanity it doesn't make sense but we're so so grateful seems like there's no lack of ideologies in this world. There's no lack of proposed solutions to the world, but 
I've come to know and believe that there is really only one solution, and his name is Jesus. And so I've committed my life to helping individuals get to Jesus because I can't shake this reality that this is the solution. This is the solution. Look how he wants to mobilize how he wants to release people into workplaces and into families and into broken systems, that they would be agents of good godly change in this world, extending the love of God, restoring that which has been broken. Let us not be concerned about the solution as all these different ways forward are being proposed. I'm convinced more than ever that this is what the world needs. Amen. I would encourage you to turn to Jesus. He turned toward you. He made it simple that if you would confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we could enter into that relationship with God where then we receive his spirit a supernatural power to live as this kind of agent of godly love in this world, then I would encourage you places, in your families, in your friend groups, in your neighborhoods, where there is this enemy, adversarial relationship, that you would heed the words of Jesus. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I want to encourage you to read God's word this week. Join us in reading the reading plan. Loving our neighbors, which is ironic because at the beginning it says, you've heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but they got it wrong. Your neighbor is also your enemy. That was the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus was like, you got it all wrong. Keep narrowing the boundary on love. As if you're following me, it's everyone is your neighbor, including your enemies. And so loving our neighbors. This is the short version. Read that. It's going to be good. And as we prepare to give here and leave from this place, I want to celebrate. Um, well, first, before we celebrate, I want to I want to urge you and, and to drive ourselves deeper into this truth of God, who He is, and what He has done, and how that changes us. These environments of worship are really powerful to help do that. And I'm thankful to God. Something that God has laid on Abby Davis's heart. If you know Abby, she's awesome. She's over there. She loves it. She is going to be leading nights of worship here on Wednesday nights here at the Mills um, starting this Wednesday. And I believe that there could be a, revi a revival, a reawakening, an igniting of something new if we can come to this and be a part of this. And so I would encourage you to look at the events tab in the River app as a help to you to know when are those happening. They're happening just about every Wednesday minus the 5th, right, um, on, through July, from June through July. July, every Wednesday, worship and prayer is going to be happening here. So be a part of that. It's going to be just a great time of growth. And so I want to invite you to see if you have any questions. And then I want to celebrate as we prepare to give because honestly, we have such a giving church. God did such an awesome thing in the community of Springdale here this week through fun and freedom. And so thank you, thank you, thank you to those of you who serve. Lori, Penny, Janine, Dave, the whole family, thank you. You're changing a community. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. So thank you for those of you who serve. Thank you so much who served in this effort. What an amazing week it was. All over it and pray that uh, eternal work would grow as a result of what has been planted this week. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your serving. This is our church. And when I say our church, I mean this is the people who come here. This is what they do. How awesome is that? Can I pray? God, that you are mobilizing people to be solutions in a world of brokenness and hate. I pray that you would help us to identify who maybe the enemies are in our lives, that we can actually love them and pray for them and change as a result. Pray that you would encourage us through that effort, that you would protect us through that effort, that you would be glorified people would be drawn to you through that effort. God, as people give of their lives for you and also of their finances, I pray that you would bless them and that you would continue to help this message, the only real solution out into this world. I pray that you would help that to happen more and more and more. We thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for this 
week through fun and freedom. We thank you for what you did this morning. Pray you'd build upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dads, I love you. I hope you have a great day. Happy Father's Day. Eat a cookie on the way out. Hope to see you next week. We'll be part a million and two next week, deeply rooted.